Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning, uh, depending on where you are watching us from. Welcome to the first session of the Global Cybersecurity Forum. My name is Oscar Avila. I am the president of, of the ISOC Cybersecurity SIG, and I'm delighted to moderate this session, Preventing Conflict in Cyberspace. What are the UN, uh, UN discussions and what they, what they do matter. Uh, I would like to make a couple of announcements. Uh, please keep your mic off during the session and uh, use the chat feature to formulate your comments and questions to, the, to our speakers. Uh, please uh, indicate your name and affiliation as well. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the webinar. So without further delay, I would like to present our esteemed uh, speakers. It's me, Joanna Weaver, who is a special advisor to the Australian uh, uh, Ambassador of Cyber Affairs, and Mr. Uh, Christopher Painter, uh, who is commissioner of the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace and President of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise Foundation uh, Board. Uh, the bios, the full bios will be posted on the chat box. And I would like to kick off uh, telling some statistics, statistics that I took from a recent report that actually described what is happening in, 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 the, in the cyberspace. Uh, cyber security has become a global problem, whether viewed in economic, humanitarian, uh, or national security terms. In economic uh, terms, the 2017 WannaCry ransomware infected uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, computer networks in 150 countries, with losses totaling up to $4 billion. The White House estimated that the total damage from NumPetya reached uh, about $10 billion. According to the U.S. Council of Economic Advisors, malicious uh, cyber activities cost between uh, 50, uh, 56 and $109 billion worth of damage to the U.S. economy in 2016 alone. Individuals, uh, meanwhile, has become uh, all accustomed to losing access to or control over otherwise uh, confidential information. Uh, researchers identified more than 5,000 data breaches of uh, uh, 9 billion records in the first month of uh, 2019. Uh, meanwhile, high-profile uh, cyber incidents such as the Stupnex, the Russian election interference, and the target of an Indian nuclear plant illustrate the national security stakes, stakes of uh, cybersecurity. So, but uh, my, actually my first question is uh, to our uh, speakers, uh, when and why the states identify cyberspace as a domain to gain economic, diplomatic, <laughs> uh, military, and political power over other nations. Uh, thank you, Oscar. Uh, thank you for hosting us. Um, and uh, thank you also to uh, Internet Society and to all of the colleagues that are uh, joining us uh, from all around the world. It's uh, always exciting to see the names popping up um, along the bottom. So countries have identified um, cyberspace as an area where they can exert power and influence for as long as cyberspace has existed. Um, and what is interesting, I think, is when you look at uh, the conversation um, that has been that is happening in the context of the United Nations. Um, the conversations there have been happening um, since 1998. And if you think about the World Wide Web having been um, invented or unleashed on the world in 1993, that means these discussions have actually been going on for quite a long time. 
Um, the discussions, despite a common perception that cyberspace is some kind of um, wild west for countries, that there aren't rules. In fact, at the United Nations, we have agreed a number of uh, norms of responsible state behaviour. We've also agreed that existing international law applies in cyberspace. And probably the most common question that I have, and I should say I currently lead Australia's delegation to um, the groups that are discussing and negotiating these rules of the road. Um, one of the most common questions I have is, well, if we have agreed all of these rules, how and why is it possible that we still keep having an increase in the severity um, of cyber incidents around the world? And as Oscar um, just reeled off there, um, we are continuing to see um, cyber incidents increase in both sophistication and scale. So agreeing the rules is, is the first step. We need to agree the rules to be able to identify if those rules are broken. Um, and just because the rules that we agree might be broken doesn't necessarily mean uh, or doesn't invalidate the use of those rules. Um, those rules are there um, and being able to identify um, that there are rules, being able to identify that the rules are broken, then provides us with a foundation from which to respond. Um, so it is, it is fundamental now, given um, our dependence on, uh, on digital infrastructure, um, that when we talk about international peace and security, international peace and stability, if we don't have a peaceful and stable cyberspace, we won't have a peaceful and stable uh, uh, international environment. And um, so one goes very directly with the other. But just as we wouldn't say um, to the United Nations, hey, um, it's your job to ensure world peace, and then all of the governments would sit back and say, that's the United Nations job, no one else has a role here. Um, we, we don't do that in the physical world, and we shouldn't be doing that when we're talking about uh, conversations for um, peace and stability in cyberspace. So the discussions that we're having at the UN, which we'll talk more about in terms of what they are um, and, what, and um, what those rules that we have agreed are. Um, but those discussions are important, but they also need to be supplemented by action by uh, governments around the world, by regional organisations, um, by industry, by civil society, by organisations like computer emergency response teams. It needs to be seen as a complete whole. So I'll, I'll stop there and hand over to Chris and then um, we'll, we'll keep going. We'd love though for questions from, from folks and we want this to be very much tailored to any questions that you have um, from, uh, from uh, out there on the floor. Thanks Joanna and it's, it's uh, like the Joanna said, it's great to be here with you today and I'm a little jealous too I have to say as many of you, uh, I, I used to travel all the time as a cyber diplomat and cyber international person and I haven't gone anywhere in the last six months. I think one of the last places I was actually was Australia. Uh, but seeing all of the people uh, in the chat room from all over the world makes me a bit jealous. So, so I'm glad you're all here. Um, and, and on the wild, wild west or wild, wild web, I remember using that term for the first time in 1998 uh, when I prosecuted an internet fraud case. And now it's, now it's pervasive, of course. Then it was novel. Now it's much more pervasive. And it's certainly the threats, um, as, as was introduced, are high. And, and I agree with that. Uh, and you guys know, as cybersecurity experts, that these technical level threats are increasing, they're getting more sophisticated, we're becoming more dependent on these technologies all over the world, not just in the, in the more developed countries, uh, and that makes us more vulnerable. And so we see a lot of these threat actors, you know, criminals are a big part, but also nation states. We see, you know, um, depending on who you ask, 40, 50, 60, everyone is trying to develop offensive cyber capabilities in their nation state level. There are reasons for that. That's natural, just like in any other technology. States you know, use it both for good and bad. You also know cybersecurity is not an end in itself. Um, cybersecurity is foundational. It helps us do all the positive things we want to do, want to do on the internet, economic growth and social growth. Uh, and uh, you know, if we don't get cybersecurity right, it will undermine a lot of that future innovation and growth. And so we have to think of those things, things together. Um, but, but, okay. I just say, if anyone's not muted their, uh, their uh, microphone, please do. <laughs> um, but, but I still think we have a problem, and I'm sure that many people in this uh, call know this, 
that is important to cybersecurity has become and you know become even uh, post COVID when it sh it shows how dependent we are on the technologies that that it's still not a high level enough priority issue in our governments around the world. It's become much higher a priority issue than it was say five or 10 years ago. Um, but at a policy level, when we're facing these nation state threats and, and policy threats too, in terms of the future of the internet and how it's run, um, you know, it's still seen as a bit of a boutique issue. And this I think uh, is why it's important that we're discussing this at, at uh, institutions like the UN at a high level. This is why it's important it's being discussed among governments at a very high level, because we need to take this out of the bubble of cybersecurity, as important as that is, and make it a core issue of our national security, of our economic security, our, and our diplomacy. I mean, this is a, this is a key diplomatic issue. And as, as important it is to understand some of the, um, you know, some of the, the, the technical issues and have a good interface with the technical community, I think people are scared of this issue because they view it as being technical. And, and you don't have to be a nuclear scientist to understand the, the, uh, the implications of, of you know, nuclear policy. You don't have to be a coder to understand the implications of cyber and cybersecurity. It helps to have people who can explain that to you, but you need to really mainstream this. And, and that goes to Joanna's uh, point earlier. There's been a lot of activity, and we'll talk more about it between us, in the UN in particular, uh, in trying to figure out what the rules of the road are, you know, that this is not some lawless space, no, not a wild west, that there are rules that apply. Um, there are things like international law that applies in the physical world. In fact, the laws that apply in the physical world apply in the cyber world. It's not a totally different thing. Uh, but also there's been a number of agreements reached among countries of what expectations are, what the, the rules of the road are, if you will, and we call these norms, you know, what, what things that people should, should embrace the country should embrace. And there's been a lot of good activity on that between countries that say, you know, certain things that countries either should do or shouldn't do. And, and one of them that I, you know, I, I, you know, a couple of them I think are really important that absent wartime, the country should not attack the critical infrastructure of another country or absent wartime, they shouldn't go after the certs or the C certs of another country because those are like the hospitals or the ambulances. Um, and, and so those kind of rules are important but we also need to follow the rules. And, and maybe I'll, you know, in a minute I'll kick it back over to Joanna and we can talk a little bit about this accountability, deterrence, the piece she, she hit on and saying that we see all these bad things and, and do these rules matter if we have all these bad things. But it's important to have these rules there. Just like it's important in the physical world, to have rules. people break rules in the physical world too, but you have to make sure there are consequences for them to do it. I'll tell you one little story before I turn it back over to Joanna to maybe talk more about this discussion. Um, you know, I gave a, a keynote to the first group in Malaysia the national conference a couple of years ago and the UN had come up with these rules including this rule don't attack uh, critical uh, don't attack the certs and this is a group of certs it's first the form of incident response and security teams and I, I told I was talking about it, I was giving the speech and one of the people raised their hands and said well it'd be great if the UN said something about protecting certs, it'd be great if the UN could agree to that. And I said, they already did agree to that. And so one of the key things we need to do, and this is why it's so important to have conversations like this, is to take these out of the bubble of the policy people like Joanna and I and others who were meeting in New York and make sure that people like you and the greater community understand these discussions, are part of these discussions, are helping to drive these discussions more generally, because it's really important for the communities we're trying to protect by these rules to be part of the discussion. So with that, let me uh, kick it back over to Joanna or, or to our, our moderator uh, to maybe talk about some of the issues, the accountability, capacity building, there's bunches of others. We can talk for days, but we only have an hour. <laughs> and we want to hear from you guys, as Joanna said. Uh, Oscar, if you're comfortable, I've, I have a, a couple of points that I can uh, pick up that, uh, that uh, were raised by Chris there. And, and in particular, this idea of um, cybersecurity being uh, a boutique issue. Um, so are you comfortable with that, uh, Oscar, if I do that? Yes, go ahead, Joanna. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Um, I think this is a really important point, right? Because um, just like other threats that we have to our national security or to our economic prosperity, there are different groups of experts who work on all of the different challenges that we have. And with cybersecurity, there still tends to be this perception that it is um, the technical experts who will have all of the solutions. And of course, if you ask a technical expert, um, someone who um, lives and breathes cybersecurity, they will um, tell you hands down that even if we manage to implement um, perfect cybersecurity, which doesn't exist, but even if we were able to have such a concept, there will, there will still be, uh, for example, flaws in uh, software that is developed that can be exploited. And just like in um, the physical world, there will always be people who, no matter how good your security is, will be looking to um, take advantage of the security um, and to act in a way um, that is contrary to agreed rules. So even if we have really, really good cybersecurity, um, and of course we need to be investing more in in increasing the skilled workforce to uh, increase uh, cybersecurity. Even if we're able to do that, there are still going to be malicious actors. And one of the things that, um, that I find really interesting in conversations um, with folks who are more on the technical side of things is when I talk about malicious actors, um, and different types of malicious actors, they often look at me with a confused look on their face and say, well, um, for us, it's just an, a malicious actor who is um, gaining access to a system, um, compromising confidentiality, availability, integrity, for example, of information. When we're looking at it from a policy side and the conversations that we're having at the UN, um, we really are looking at who are the malicious actors. And the reason that that's important is because whilst the technical response to who the actors are doesn't change necessarily, you, your focus will be on remediation or on uh, preventing the incident happening at, the, at all. When it comes to what are the consequences of acting maliciously, the consequences that we will um, impose or the, comp uh, the, the way that we respond once the incident has been remediated, that will depend on what the actor is. And to use a real world example of this, if someone were to break into your house um, and um, we became aware that um, the person responsible for breaking into your house was um, uh, someone who had been paid by the government of another state, you would probably call uh, the intelligence services or your internal security agency. But if someone broke into your house um, and they were a criminal, you would call the police. And by that analogy, when we have cyber intrusions, the people and who we have to respond to incidents will differ depending on, um, uh, depending on who the um, malicious actor is. And likewise, when we're talking about intellectual property theft, for example, if someone um, is stealing um, uh, state secrets, um, your response would be different to if someone was stealing commercial secrets. Um, so these are all things um, that we are looking at in terms of the types of actors, but also the types of rules that we're agreeing. Yeah, and I, I just add to that, that, you know, when I was a criminal prosecutor, we always thought about this and, and try to explain to victims, often cybercrime victims were reticent to come forward, especially businesses. And, and we, you know, you make the analogy that you know, it's important to do all you can to harden your targets, just like you would in the physical world. You'd lock the doors and you bolt the windows. But that's only half a solution. That, that part of cybersecurity is only half a solution because inevitably people are going to break in. And if there are no consequences for the people who break in, they're going to come back, they're going to come in stronger, and, and that, that's a problem. And that, that goes to this, this larger point of, um, of why we can't treat this as this boutique issue because we're going to see these incidents, they're going to increase, and, and we have to make sure we're both preventing them by doing everything we can to, to bolster our cybersecurity. And we made progress on that, but I think everyone on this call would probably say we haven't done enough. Um, you know, it's, it's a long road, certainly, uh, and it will continue to be a long road. But I think we made some progress. But there also has to be consequences for those who are either criminals or nation states for, for bad actions. Now, criminals 
is a little easier because, uh, you know, even before cybersecurity became a thing, cybercrime was a thing. You know, people were focusing on, on this for a long time. Back in the 90s, people were talking about this. Uh, and there are ways for law enforcement to tackle this. It's important for countries to have strong cybercrime laws, uh, like the Budapest Convention, for instance. It's, it's important for countries to have good trained law enforcement. It's important for countries to cooperate internationally. That, that deals with the criminal threat, and you know, we need to do more there, certainly. Um, but the nation state threat is a little harder. So how do you keep these people from doing bad things? And it goes back to this, this kind of rule of the road making that we're, we're doing in the UN that, that Joanna and others have been involved in negotiating, is that you know, as important it is to set those rules, to set those expectations, because some of them are voluntary rules, um, you know, they're really just words on paper if uh, people break them willy-nilly and there's no consequences, there's no accountability for those that do that. And so I think one of the, the real challenges now is how do you hold criminals? I think we know how to do that. We need to do it better. But nation states, how do you hold them accountable? And is there the political will to do that? You know, I, uh, Oscar mentioned the NotPetya case and the WannaCry case in the beginning. And, and I can say, I, now that I'm out of government, I can be more frank about these things than I could be in government. <laughs> but I can say that, uh, look, it was very important that we got a number of countries, including Australia and the US and others, that come out and publicly condemn that and also attribute that conduct to, um, uh, and to Russia and North Korea, uh, uh, respectively. But you're not going to name and shame certain actors by naming them. You know, it's important to name them because it helps build support and makes it a collective action of the international community, absolutely. So I think that's a good step. But if you don't follow through with some consequences for those bad actors, they're gonna say, ah, that was a pretty costless enterprise, I'll do it again. Uh, we've seen this with election interference in our country. You know, So uh, it not only encourages those bad actors, but it makes other ones who might be on the fence to say, why don't I do this too? There's no real challenge to me. So we need to be better at doing that, we need to be better at doing that as a global community. So acting not just by nation state to nation state, but number of nation states coming together, there's good activity there. But also I think this involves some of the other stakeholders uh, on this call, the private sector, some of the experts here, what are the things we can do? How can we do this in a more organized way? And that, you know, when you do these kinds of things, because you could do sanctions, economic sanctions, you could do diplomatic actions, you can do criminal indictments, you can do cyber actions, you need to be careful not to be escalatory, which means you don't want to make it worse than it was in the first place, but you need to try to reinforce this, just like we do in the physical world. If there are no consequences, then things deteriorate into chaos. So this is one of the things and challenges, I think, that's certainly facing governments, but also is a matter that goes beyond governments. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm seeing a couple of the um, questions popping up here in the chat. Um, so, Oscar, Chris and I will keep going backwards and forwards uh, with each other, but please jump in at, at any point. Um, so, there have been a couple of really good questions that have come up um, in the chat, um, looking at what are, um, how do you set rules of engagement, uh, for example, when uh, national laws are still decades behind? Um, how do we keep up uh, in, a, in an international environment when we're struggling nationally? Um, and I think that is a really good question. And there is actually a very simple answer to that question. And it is that we need to adopt a technology neutral approach to um, the rules and norms um, that we are setting. So for example, um, when we're looking at um, how do you prevent conflict in cyberspace, if you have, um, if you look at the rules that we have established that have been there for decades at the United Nations on how to prevent conflict, we agree, for example, that you should respect um, the sovereignty of uh, individual states, that you shouldn't interfere in the internal affairs of states, um, that you uh, should settle disputes by peaceful means. So what we've done is we've said, well, actually, all of these existing principles of international law are applicable in cyberspace. So if it is not okay to interfere in the elections of another state or to interfere in the internal affairs of another state um, using non-cyber means, it is not okay to do that using cyber means. 
Um, if you had an obligation um, to uh, settle a dispute between two countries peacefully um, because there was some kind of physical or kinetic conflict, you have an obligation to resolve disputes in cyberspace peacefully. Um, now, that could include, for example, um, referring a dispute to the United Nations Security Council. Um, this hasn't happened yet, but, we, but it is something that could happen. So in the same way, uh, by, by adopting that technology neutral approach um, to the legal framework, it means that that legal framework can very quickly and easily adapt and we don't have to keep updating it. So by the same token, we have um, agreed at the UN a number of um, norms of responsible state behaviour. Chris referred to a few of these. Um, the norms are also agreed in a non-technology um, specific way. So they for example, say you should not use ICTs to damage the critical infrastructure of another state. We don't say you should not use malware to damage the critical infrastructure of another state. We do not say you should not use artificial intelligence. By using that catch-all term, ICTs, um, we are future-proofing the rules that we are agreeing in the United Nations context. Um, and then um, when it comes to what are the rules with respect to cybercrime, um, Chris mentioned um, the Budapest Convention. This is a fabulous international convention. Um, it contains model laws. So for countries, for example, that don't yet have um, legislation that makes cybercrime within your jurisdiction a crime, it contains model laws that you can pick up and use within your jurisdiction. Again, the Budapest Convention adopts a technology neutral approach that allows us to future proof the work that we're doing. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think, you know, sorry on the cybercrime side, that, that has always been uh, a tenet of trying to make these technology neutral. Um, you know, it, it, and many countries still don't have cybercrime laws. And, you know, there are two kinds of cybercrime the old wine and new bottles, like, typical fraud and other things that are done using the internet. There's a new kinds of crimes, attacking computers, attacking computer infrastructure. Uh, and that often does need new laws. Um, you know, there was a famous case, the I love you virus many, many years ago, uh, where we traced it back to someone in the Philippines, but the Philippines didn't have a law that made that illegal at the time and they do now. Uh, so having the laws in place, I think is, is really critically important. And I remember in the US law, it was important to make it technology neutral there was another country, another big country, I won't name where they are, uh, very big country, um, who um, their law was so specific and so technology focused that every time a new attack came, like a new kind of denial of service attack, they had to update their law, which is just not the way to do it, right? So, so Jana is, is quite right that in the, these UN proceedings, uh, trying to make a technology neutral so we don't have to change it is important. And I'd say that it's not just in the UN proceedings. We, we should also mention that there are regional thing, uh, activities going Absolutely. on um, in the Organization of American States. We're looking at a lot of these issues. Um, uh, the ASEAN countries are looking at that. Uh, in, the, in Europe, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe has, has spent a lot of time on another aspect of this uh, called confidence building measures. You know, How can you build confidence between states when we don't really understand the cyber thing and how it could escalate out of control? So things like hotlines, uh, you know, kind of, you know, not, not much rocket science there. I mean, things that, you know, really will build a better understanding and help to de-escalate de conflict. So it's not all at the UN, but it's important to have these discussions in these forums and to try to bring them together. And, and, and also trying to demystify it a bit. So if you use a lot of technical terms, people don't understand it. If you make it clear to policymakers, as I said in the opening, you know, let's demystify this and, and mainstream this. And they understand what it means, you know, not to, you know, and for instance, don't cause damage to a critical infrastructure. You don't need to be a cyber expert to know what that means. <laughs> so, so it's important to do that. I have a, I have uh, a question. And I, yes, go ahead. I have a question, Johanna. Uh, is there any kind of incentive to make adherence to cyber norms more attractive for the nations? Mm. That is a really, really good question, Oscar. Um, I think there are many incentives uh, for behaviour in... Uh, so why would any country act responsibly 
in the international environment at all. They want to act responsibly because they want to be respected on an international stage, because they want to have credibility, um, because they want to be seen as leaders, because they want others to adopt and follow their models. So in terms of incentives, it's about are you a good global citizen as a country? Um, and this is where um, the public attributions that Chris was talking to earlier, where we came out and we said, um, actually, uh, WannaCry, we are attributing WannaCry uh, to DPRK um, and we are attributing NotPetya to uh, Russian state-sponsored actors. Part of that is to say, if you act um, in violation of the agreements that we have made at the United Nations, we will make this public, we will make it known that you are not being a responsible actor in cyberspace. Um, that's the sort of um, maintaining your image as a good global citizen, um, being able to project um, the type of behaviour in cyberspace that you want um, is an incentive. And then as Chris was talking about, there is also, well, what are the consequences? So I guess the flip side of incentives is consequences. And the consequences um, might be things like um, indictments um, for uh, individuals involved in particular behaviours. It might be criminal proceedings. It might be financial sanctions. And the consequences part um, is important um, and it is probably the, the least mature part of the conversation. Um, but it is really about creating a system of accountability. We need to agree the rules, we need to implement the rules and we need to make sure um, that th there is accountability if countries are not then following the rules. So I, th I think there's a little bit, and there is an incentive because many countries do care about the way they're viewed in the world. Not, not every country. So if you have a rogue country, North Korea is a hard one to deal with, right? It just is. But most countries, you know, do care how they're viewed. And one important part is to take this outside of just the cyber realm. So you, you might, guys might recall that uh, several years ago, there was, a, and there still is now, unfortunately, a huge uh, tension issue between the US, and not just the US, but many countries in China, over the wholesale theft of intellectual property and trade secrets and things like that. Um, and what I think really moved the ball on that uh, and got China to come to the negotiating table and agree that that kind of conduct to benefit their commercial or any country's commercial sector was off limits, which they agreed to with the US, but then agreed to also in this group of the G20, so all the major uh, economic powers, was that we didn't treat it, uh, and then President Obama didn't treat it as a cyber issue. We treated it as a core economic and national security issue that affected the overall relationship between China and the US. So when countries really care about how they're viewed, when they care about economic and other issues, if you use those levers, I think that that helps move the ball along and get people uh, involved. Now, as Joanna said, you know, the other side of the, the incentive is the stick. Um, you don't want to use that if you don't have to, but sometimes, you know, you have to, to make clear that this is unacceptable behavior. Uh, and that I think we need, as I said, we need to get better at. Um, you know, when the Skirpal poisoning happening happened, uh, within a week, uh, then Theresa May said it was Russia. Within two weeks, uh, there was a major group of sanctions that were done with not Petia, it took six and a half months to say it was Russia. Now there are attribution, other issues to be sure. Um, but then it, the, there was a promise of activity after that. And so we need to be better at, at shortening that time frame and making that clear. If you're gonna deter someone, it has to be um, you know, quick or relatively quick after the thing happened and it has to actually change the behavior. And so we have to get there and, and we're, not, we're not there yet, unfortunately. And I saw a question that you know, the tease off of this, that teed off of what was said, saying, it's great there's international, there's agreement international law applies in cyberspace, but we continue to see international law broken. Uh, yes, but you know what? We do in the physical world too. So people think of cyber as this bubble. We see that happen. Look, look what happened in Crimea. I mean, we see this around the world. There are incursions uh, into, you know, there are violations of international law. There are violations of agreed upon norms. Uh, are the folks who agree to them disingenuous? Maybe, depending, maybe they have their own political reasons for doing this, but that's why it's important to hold them accountable because otherwise they'll continue to do that, both in the physical world and the cyber world. Oh, 
Oh, and I, I see this other question, how many countries have, uh, well, actually it was just privately, but I'll, I'll say it publicly anyway. Uh, someone asked how many countries have imposed sanctions other than the US and how uh, successful have sa economic sanctions been? Uh, quite a few now. Uh, the US, I think we had the first cyber sanctions order back in 2015. Um, it took us a while to use it. Um, we finally did use it uh, on the election interference and some other issues. Uh, but just recently, the, the EU, the, the European Union, they created a, a cyber sanctions regime uh, and they used it. And they used it on, I think it was Russian, as I recall, Russian, Chinese, Iranian, I, I, and North Korean actors, I think. There was a range of actors they went after. And that was really significant uh, because in the EU, they had to get agreement of all the EU countries. It wasn't just one or two countries. All of them agreed to impose these sanctions. And sanctions can be effective if they're used right. You know, when you're trying to deter someone, you look for what's going to change their behavior. And that's going to be different from country to country. Uh, but economic issues are key to every country. So if you do them right and you do them collectively, I think they can have real power. Thanks, Chris. I think the um, the developments around um, the EU cyber sanctions are, as you say, um, a very important um, a step forward in terms of um, ensuring that there is accountability. Um, and I, I really like that question of um, is it disingenuous um, of countries engaging in these negotiations? Um, I think there is a real commitment uh, to agree rules of the road. Um, and then, of course, um, there will be um, uh, different interpretations of rules of the road. Um, these are a negotiated compromise. Um, and um, as Chris so eloquently pointed out, um, they will be breached. Um, not, uh, not always we don't expect them to be breached, but we shouldn't necessarily be surprised when they are. Um, it's then a question of, well, how are we going to respond? Um, and those uh, developments that Chris was talking about are really important. Um, and um, the, um, the application of international law to cyberspace um, is a very important foundation for us because it provides us with an entire framework that we can then measure the behaviour um, and in doing so be able to have expectations of how we uh, expect um, responsible countries to be acting um, in this environment. Um, in terms of the question there about how has COVID affected um, the UN work and has there been um, any positives that have come out of um, the virtual um, discussions or from moving the discussions online? Um, so I guess the, the biggest challenges or the biggest noticeable difference that we've had um, is that the open ended working group was due to conclude um, uh, in June, uh, which it has not. We have um, postponed uh, the final meeting, we weren't able to meet in New York. Um, we're now due to meet in New York at the start of March. Um, and the uh, group of government experts um, has also uh, postponed its in-person in -person meetings and we're meeting online. So I think um, the positives of moving the discussions online have meant that we've really been able to start a conversation that frankly I was not expecting us to be able to have as in depth as we are now about what comes next. So whilst we've been discussing these issues at the United Nations for quite a long time, they've been on an ad hoc basis. So um, there hasn't been necessarily um, a set process and there haven't, uh, the discussions haven't happened every year. Um, it is very clear now um, through the discussions that we've had over the past 18 months that there is a real appetite for these discussions to continue at the diplomatic level um, on a regular ongoing basis. Um, so one of the real benefits of the delay is that um, it is, or the postponement of the final meeting, is that it is allowing us to have a conversation to say, well, what do we want that new institutional mechanism within the UN to look like? How can we shape it so that we can have input from um, private sector organisations? How can we shape it so that we can have civil society and NGOs um, engaging? How can we best um, incorporate capacity building into the work that we're doing? Um, and I think having that really, having the time to have a considered conversation about the best format for the discussions going forward has actually been a, a real positive from the discussions. 
Um, it wasn't part of the question, but I'm going to take it as implied, is what are the challenges of, of moving discussions online? Um, obviously, the lack of ability to meet face to face means that there are simply some sensitive conversations that don't happen. And uh, as I said uh, earlier, um, these negotiations, when we are looking at adding an additional layer of understanding on what it is to be a responsible state, state country acting in cyberspace, um, it will be a carefully negotiated compromise and not being able to have quiet conversations um, in the hallways or over coffee um, to identify what your counterparts, where your counterparts lines, um, red lines, and where they may have room to maneuver um, is a very, very difficult thing. You can't, it's not necessarily possible to do that um, in a virtual forum where everything is on the record. Um, so that is the real downside. But there is also that real positive of um, time for considered discussions on, on what's next. I think there's also a positive because um, everyone's doing everything online now, uh, as everyone knows. And uh, in my organization, the uh, Global Forum on uh, uh, Cyber Expertise, which is a global capacity building uh, uh, group, which has about 65 countries in it, lots of private sector entities, uh, civil society, academia, so a real multi-stakeholder group to try to to look at all these issues, including things like certs, but also things like international law and diplomacy, um, and try to get more awareness, more understanding. Uh, we've done so many virtual meetings, it's crazy. So uh, as many of you have, and that's, that's good. It's, not it's just by necessity. And the good thing about virtual meetings is they're more inclusive. Lots of countries who may have not been able to travel or have all the right people at a particular meeting can participate virtually, so that's good. But I'd agree with Joanna. Uh, look, mm. there's no substitute for being in the same room with folks and having those side conversations. Um, you know, so we hope to have to get back to that at, at some point. Mm. Uh, you know, I think it's just. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the challenges actually with the with the discussions, particularly in the open ended working group, which is all 193 countries, is actually surprisingly the virtual conversations often aren't as inclusive as the in person conversations because. The reality is every country um, or almost every country has a mission, has a, an embassy in New York and can send a person to those discussions. Um, they may not be their expert, but at least there'll be someone. Um, whereas we're finding because of the time um, at which the discussions are being held, for example, it's the middle of the night in the Pacific. Um, it does make it really difficult um, for certain countries to attend. Um, and also there's an issue of connectivity. Not everyone has um, secure, has stable internet that can facilitate these types of conversations. So it can, it can definitely work both ways. Yeah, and just um, for background, you know, the, the, this is the first time there's two groups. Um, the group of governmental experts, as they call it, which is a you know, UN term, uh, has yeah. had a number of countries between 20 and 25 over the years. And there's a new one now that's meeting, as, and, and Joanna, as Joanna knows. Uh, and that's the one that's made, it's sort of a crucible. It's a smaller group of countries. It's made a lot of progress saying international law applies, saying that, you know, coming up with these 11 norms of behavior, we only talked about a couple. This open-ended working group is a new thing. And as Joanna said, it's all the countries. And, and that's actually been very beneficial to get all these countries to discuss these issues. Uh, and, you know, they don't have all the same priorities. I mean, it's interesting you know, at least the sessions I, I've been in as a now an outsider, uh, another stakeholder, is a lot of folks raise the issue of capacity building. A lot of countries raise that as a foundational issue. Um, a lot of them want to really, you know, talk about that before they talk about the other issues. So I think it's been useful. And I, I'll, I'll admit I was surprised. I thought these would be very conflicting. But at least from my perspective, it's been useful that those have been seemingly working together uh, or not working together, depending on what result they come out with. <laughs> uh, but uh, they seem to be much more in sync than I would have thought. And that's been a beneficial thing to have both the crucible that can make decisions and the wider group that can really raise awareness on this. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, Chris, that jumps into two of the questions that are there in terms of um, what will come next? Will we keep having these two parallel tracks of discussions? Um, or, and, um, you know, what will happen? Uh, will the GGE and the open-ended working group, um, are they working in a complementary fashion or are they competing? Um, and certainly at the moment, we have the two processes that are working in a very complementary fashion. Um, so the group of ex, I'm, I'm Australia's representative on both groups. 
Um, and it's really noticeable to me how we're having very similar conversations, um, but the, uh, the focus of the groups is very different. So um, in the group of government experts, we're really drilling down and saying, okay, we've taken and we've agreed, um, for example, these 11 norms of behavior. Um, one of them is that states should protect their critical infrastructure. What can we as a group of experts provide as best practice guidance um, for implementation of that norm? So that the norm becomes something that isn't just a norm on a piece of paper, but is something that countries um, are more readily able to implement. Um, so the GG is really getting down into that detail and into the nitty gritty. Um, and then you have um, the open-ended working group, um, which is 193 countries, as opposed to the GG, which is 25. Um, and when you have 193 countries, by uh, just by pure practicality, um, the discussions are much more inclusive, um, but they're not necessarily drilling down on the same level of detail. But it's really, really important that um, we make sure that all countries are aware um, of uh, international law and of the norms, that they're committed to them, that they are committed to being responsible global citizens in cyberspace. So having that broad discussion um, is incredibly important. And what we're really seeing is that broad discussion um, is, is pulling and, and we're hearing a strong call for more capacity building in this field. Um, and obviously this is an area that Chris um, uh, is um, very much um, focused on. Um, so I'll pass to Chris on the capacity building. I just want to um, quickly answer the question um, of uh, what next in terms of, okay, we have um, the open-ended working group is due to finish in March. It's due to produce a report. And then we have the GGE uh, also due to finish um, in May this uh, coming year. What happens next? Um, and that is very much a live discussion at the moment. Um, there are many proposals uh, on the table. Um, there is a proposal uh, that Russia has for the extension of the open-ended working group um, for another five years. Um, there are also proposals on the table that are being discussed, for example, to establish a program of action um, uh, for, or in, for responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And um, a program of action, for example, would be not dissimilar to the open-ended working group in the sense that um, it would be inclusive, all countries could be involved, but it would just bring a bit more structure um, and um, create something that could be a permanent, regular uh, meeting um, that could um, be provide, um, for example, a political declaration, uh, it could have capacity building support, it could have national reporting um, included in it. So the discussion of what's next is, is a very, very live discussion. Um, and I don't want to get down into the procedural nitty gritty, but um, uh, it is something um, that uh, will, uh, there are discussions that will happen in the next month or so um, that will actually be quite determinative in this. And we hope that um, we hope that uh, Russia's proposal to extend the open-ended working group um, can be postponed momentarily while we continue the discussions while we finish the open-ended working group because I'm optimistic that we can actually come up with something like a program of action and um, that could provide um, a better stronger option for regular institutional dialogue at the United Nations. Um, so that's very much uh, front of mind for us. Um, Oscar, I can see you're on screen. Um, I think it would also be good to hear from Chris in terms of what we're doing um, in capacity building, but I'll pass to you, Oscar. Okay. Um, I, I think that before uh, uh, throw my questions, why not we hear from, from, from Chris? And, and my question is about, I know that the main business of this webinar are the UN cyber norms, but there are other ecosystems of cyber norms that have emerged in, in different fora and, and formats. So I would like to get your comments on, 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 on this specific one. Thank you. So, so let, me, let me start and, and tail off on uh, what uh, Joanna was saying too. I mean, first there's a question that comes up among people, especially I think on this call, is how do you get involved in these discussions? I mean, these are a lot of government to government discussions. And there are avenues. I mean, look, the UN was built for states, so it's not built for other stakeholders. Uh, but I think they're trying to be more open about this. There's been some progress in the open-ended working group. 
not not as much as people would like to see, but there's been some to try to involve other stakeholders. Uh, you know, I give Australia a lot of credit to actually holding uh, consultations with other stakeholders for their their own country. You know, if you, it, it'd probably be worth talking to the people in your country and your government to see if there's ways that you can involve yourself or or be involved in that. But the other aspect certainly is through some of these regional organizations like the OAS, APEC, and others. So there's a variety of ways to get in. Um, you mentioned also this other other processes for norms. So I was a commissioner on this global commission for the stability of cyberspace, for instance. And and although that commission, that commission looked at how we advance stability more broadly, um, and and I, I you know in cyberspace. And I think it was first, it was a multi-stakeholder group at people like Vin Cerf and and the former uh, uh, president of, or uh, prime minister of Sweden, Carl Bildt. Uh, and people from you know, private industry and Marina Kaljurand, the former foreign minister of Estonia. Uh, so a good group of folks and some technologists as well. Um, and it, it, you know, this was right after the, this group of governmental experts in the UN who had very successful meetings in 2013 and 2015 kind of collapsed in 2017. They weren't able to reach an agreement. And, and look, we all think about cyber, but there are lots of things happening in the world that cause conflict between countries. And so that, that was one of them. And there is today too, which makes all of this more difficult. Uh, so cyber is sometimes the, the slave of all these other things that are going on and they weren't able to reach a consensus. So we recommended both a framework, you know, increased capacity building was a key part, uh, more dialogue on these issues, uh, other stakeholders involved in these issues. We had a number of norms. I think most of those norms, however, could be fit within the, existing UN norms. For instance, we proposed one of don't, don't screw basically with the public core of the internet. That's not the actual language. Uh, it was don't, don't disrupt, don't destroy the public core of the internet. That's something that we all depend on. Uh, I think you can say that that's part of the critical infrastructure norm, for instance. Uh, you know, don't go after election systems. I think that's one too. And the norms we proposed were not just for states. There were also ones that, that apply to the private sector and some of its responsibility. So I think that was important. So I think it was important to have those, but, but then one of our key recommendations, I think is an under, undergirding pillar foundational element for all this is, as Joanna said, capacity building, which we, you know, came up often in New York. And capacity building, you know, the problem is on, on the technical level, lots of countries don't have the capability to deal with these threats. Uh, on a policy level, they don't have things like national strategies that prioritize this or institutions like national level certs to deal with this. Um, and then also on a policy level, how do you do incident response? How do you raise awareness? Uh, Cybercrime is a big policy issue. And, and the, this GFC group, and I posted the, the website for people to look at at www.thegfc.org, um, recognizes there's not a lot of resources yet around what we need to do uh, for capacity building in cyber. And it's brought together all these stakeholders and groups that deal with strategy and policy, which includes things like norms and CBMs and how we advance awareness of these. We're not trying to negotiate them. We're trying to make people aware of them and help them implement them. Um, incident response, cybercrime, awareness and training. Uh, and I think that's been a very important, uh, important element because countries both need to have that technical ability but they also need to have the policy capability. They need to be able to involve themselves uh, in these discussions that are happening in the UN. They, they can't just be sitting on the, uh, in their seats and not participating. It makes us all stronger to have stronger capacity being around, building around the world. And look, there's a lot more to be done there. Um, I like to see cyber capacity building being part of the whole world development agenda. It's not yet, I like to see that happen. That's the mainstreaming issue. Um, I want countries to prioritize this, even though uh, funds are often short, because um, there's a lot of need out there, I'd say. We've worked with countries to help them build their national strategies. We've talked about issues like put out papers on CBMs and, and other issues, the confidence building measures. Um, we're not the only ones doing this. I think we're the only ones really trying to coordinate this, but lots of countries, including Australia, are involved in doing very important, both regional and national and international capacity building efforts. And that's another way that people on this call, I think, can get involved or this Zoom call. Yeah, I, I think um, the coordination of capacity building is uh, a real priority and uh, the GFC uh, does a great job in providing a platform um, for, for both donors, but also recipients to be aware of um, what, uh, what uh, capacity building is available, but also what the real needs are. 
um, so that the capacity building is being designed um, to respond to those needs. Um, and certainly as more and more countries um, are uh, becoming aware of these discussions, becoming aware of these commitments, and, and as uh, Chris said, it's not about necessarily um, agreeing more, it's about facilitating and ensuring that countries can implement them. Um, there are uh, certainly proposals, and, and uh, Chris mentioned um, the GFCE, but there's also things like the Paris call. Um, there's conversations that are happening um, uh, in ASEAN at the East Asia Summit, in the G20. Um, there are all sorts of conversations, um, but my very first priority is um, that we actually implement what we have agreed before we put something else on paper. You know, if it's a choice between having a longer list on paper or a shorter list on paper that's implemented, I'd take the shorter list that is implemented every time. Um, I, I think also um, the, the benefit and what countries are beginning to see through their participation in the open-ended working group is they see this as an opportunity. Um, as, we have, um, as we have diplomats, if we have people in the national security um, communities, um, senior people appreciating and realising um, the potential threats in this space, um, and we make this aware uh, at an international level. If we have these um, recommendations that come out of the UN, that then has a flow on effect at a national level, but it means hopefully that we will start to see more resources flowing um, to uh, the operational communities, to the CERT communities, to um, those that are doing um, capacity building work. So my, um, my uh, plea, I guess, to everyone that is here is please find a way to get involved in these discussions. Um, certainly, um, uh, there is lots of information um, on uh, Australia's website. If you go to dfat.gov.au forward slash cyber affairs, we have a whole page with resources and materials, um, including some really short videos um, that are animated videos that explain what the process is so far and what the norms are that we have agreed. Um, they're a really good entry point in terms of um, uh, being able to introduce this discussion um, to colleagues um, that have never heard of these things before. Um, so this is a great opportunity um, to, to become involved but use it as a way that you can drive and, and secure resources um, for yourselves as well. Yeah, and uh, I see some people posting in the chat that ask about some uh, initiatives that they have and sometimes uh, national initiatives. You know, I think these are important, even if they're national initiatives, to be best practices for other people looking at this. Um, yeah. One of the things that GFC does is we have a portal called the Civil Portal, which tries to uh, amass all these best practices to make it easier for countries and other stakeholders to look at this and not reinvent the wheel. So if you have great initiatives na nationally, that's really helpful to, to others. Uh, and um, several people asked me to explain the background I have, uh, so I'll do that very quickly. Uh, I don't have a giant computer behind me, but uh, in real life, but this is the computer Colossus uh, it, uh, at Bletchley Park in the UK. Uh, and it was uh, the first addressable electronic programmable computer in the world. Uh, and it was used in the 1940s to break the Lorenz code, the high level Nazi code. Uh, many people know I'm fond of computer movies, and there's a computer movie called Colossus, where it's the first movie in 1970 where computers take over the world. The real Colossus that is not dystopian. This 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 computer actually helped save the world. So uh, so that's what my background is. <laughs> uh, and as Joanna said, you know I really do encourage all of you guys to stay in this game, even if you're more in the technical community. These policy issues are going to affect you. They're going to affect the future for all of us. Uh, it's a long-term game. These issues are not, these problems are not going to be solved overnight. But I think everyone recognizes we have to pull together and there needs to be more interaction between the technical community and the policy community. So, so very much thank you for participating. Okay. Okay, for those who wants to uh, uh, wants to know more details or get into uh, uh, this uh, conversation, uh, I recommend you to to explore this cyber diplomacy uh, uh, course um, offered by the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs. Uh, I posted uh, the link so you can you can explore that course as well. And I would like to I would like to thank uh, uh, Chris and Johanna for sharing 
uh, their knowledge and experience on this particular uh, um, uh, topic. So I have seen that most of the questions have been answered already. Um, I don't know if Johanna or Chris wants to add something else, uh, or otherwise we 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 already hit the hour. So um, 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 I would like to thank again the our audience for joining us today. And I don't know, Chris and Johanna, if you want to add something else before closing. I Really, uh, thank you to Oscar for reaching out. Thank you for facilitating the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I just saw a very quick question pop up saying, is the uh, UNODA course free? It is free, it's available online. Um, and um, I will um, post, once I finish talking, um, the link to the DFAT website um, with the uh, resources there as well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having us. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter. It's not a shameless plug, but I do put up a lot of information in terms of how you can get involved um, in the processes going forward. Okay. Uh, and I also want to thank Oscar and all of you guys for participating and Joanna, of course, it's nice to see her virtually as we have fairly often over the last few months. Um, but thank you all. And I do think this is something that that is an urgent issue that really welcome all of your involvement. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter too. I occasionally put up useful stuff. Sometimes I put up uh, funny stuff, but uh, um, but I uh, do uh, appreciate interacting with all of you today. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Chris and Johanna, and of course the audience again. And we will be having more webinars this month to commemorate the Cyber Awareness Month. So please stay tuned and visit our website for further information. Hey, Oscar. Uh, yes, sir. Um, that someone asked for Joanna and I and my uh, handle. Joanna, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. It's at underscore Johanna Weaver. And, and mine's at C underscore painter. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So thank you so much and have a nice day. Thanks, Oscar. Thanks, hey, everyone. You're welcome. Ciao. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.